uh, resume of the week and some more ideas and research about resilience and what that term means. On the slide, we've got the photograph of a boat going towards Niagara Falls uh, with a rainbow. And I like that image because the boat is going towards very, very rough waters, but with the expectation that it's not going to fall beneath the water. And furthermore, there's a rainbow. So it's a positive idea of responding to difficulties. So we start with this question of how could meditation help boost resilience? And we'll be looking a little bit at some examples of programs which have fostered this term resilience. Now it's a very, it's a bit of a buzzword resilience. It means lots of different things, but one of the way, simple ways that people think of it is being able to bounce back from adversity. So there are even some programs, uh, there's one, pro there's one uh, Department of Education in the um, University of Brighton in Sussex which has got a program called Boeing, Boeing, <laughs> because you know it's that like Boeing Springs and they have these very encompassing uh, policies and programs at all levels and at all ages to support children in cultivating resilience right through school. And they're thinking of it in a very multifaceted way. So one of the things that's evolved with the people's understanding of resilience is that it's not just a wonderful trait that some individuals are born with. It is also something that can be supported by the way that you set um, organizations up, you set up cultures in schools, you have attitudes in uh, the way people relate to each other. There are many different facets that support resilience. And so the shift has been from, instead of thinking of purely trying to make people better from things that go wrong, is thinking of it the other way around, that we cannot avoid tough things happening to us in life. And a better way forward is to try and cultivate resources within us and with our families and communities morning. that will good morning that will give us tools to tackle things that in a way we can't predict and we can't stop. So the first list there, which I'll go through, is taken from a book um, which is written by uh, two American professionals who are particularly looking, have been looking at resilience from the point of view of the military. And they, um, as well as from people who've suffered quite severe trauma. And they have talked to soldiers, for example, who've been captive, who've been tortured. They've tried to see what is it that really sustains people in these very extreme situations. And so they've come up with this list that the things that they observed that made the difference um, are those things that optimism that in some ways we do need to have a belief that there could be something better that we need to be able to face fear which is a very very big one and one of the practices we looked at this week was helping us with that I think when the one which was with um, befriending difficulties then they found that people who had a moral compass, um, who, were, who were very much grounded in an ethical scheme of values and were also altruistic, they're all quite big things, but those things really made a difference to people, uh, which obviously in some ways often is linked as well with some kind of adherence to religion or spirituality. So we've got those dimensions, and we've also got social support. And in other ways that people have thought about resilience, they see that as very, very key, that people do feel some support. And that links with some of the thinking we were looking at about bonding and the need for connection 
and the need for connection with ourselves and others. And then role models, being able to be inspired by the fact that other people have perhaps coped. And I think we sometimes get that kind of example from people in our families or our parents or grandparents or uh, people in society who have managed to show us a way of managing very big problems, um, people who've, who've had very catastrophic injuries. I mean, I, I, somewhere or other in my papers, I, in my local paper, about two weeks before I came, there was an article which was showing how um, soldiers who sadly ha um, lost part of their limbs are visiting schools and talking about how they've managed to create a positive life for themselves so that they can give role models to children to show how people do overcome very extreme adversities. So that's a practical example. And then they, being in a military sort of context, they found that if people were able to, f to do things physically that would strengthen their bodies also made a difference and also the brain. And this is where we come back to some of the meditation, that, that being able to focus our mind and heart and not be taken over by negative thoughts or going over and over and over worries and memories would obviously be very, very helpful, uh, which links with cognitive and emotional flexibility. And, and finding some meaning and purpose. There are, there are quite a few of, uh, of philosophers uh, who have also pointed out how um, if people have a sense of meaning, they can manage suffering. Mu whereas if it all seems very random and meaningless, it's very difficult. Uh, there was an example of um, a man called Frankel, who was in a concentration camp in Germany in the Second World War, and he, he's written a book called In Search of Meaning, and the, he, that was the distinction he made. He said those who survived were people who could find meaning in the, in the process. So it's a, very, it's a very challenging list for us to try and emulate, but it's also giving us some guidelines of, of what kinds of things could support everyone in our world to help them face uh, unknown challenge. So we were just to review where we started in thinking about meditation, that we, in, in the kind of research we were looking at, which was based very much on Richard Davidson and Daniel Goleman's book, The Science of Meditation, they um, have pointed out that we need to remember that we're not talking about meditation in this context a lot, uh, as if we've been practicing several hours a day for years and years and years. There's a very, very big difference in the effects you see at that level. But yet, it's possible to do practice for a shorter time and still see some positive outcomes. And that's the kind of um, exercise that we're imagining might be of value to children, young people, adults, and so on. Because it could be integrated more easily into work life or education systems. And one of the distinctions that goes with that is that we, there are changes that um, might become permanent, which are called traits, so that you permanently have change. Whereas on the other hand, a lot of shorter term outcomes with meditation create states. So we might have felt during our practice that we noticed we felt a positive state of well-being after we had tried doing the, no the loving kindness meditation. But we may not be feeling quite like that at the moment <laughs> this morning. So it's it, the idea in all the traditions of spirituality is that we're aiming to be imbued with these higher states of humanity at a, in a permanent way, that we are exhibiting equanimity, <coughs> love, compassion, and it, and it doesn't go away. And then we also were thinking about how different practices 
can really help integration in our neural networks, in our whole body-mind system, and also from the point of view of creating a coherent waveform in our energy and what we're emanating and in between, <coughs> between our heart and all our other <coughs> systems in our body. And in other ways we can think about it as we can facilitate a better attunement with both ourselves and others and a state of balance. So when we looked at the research we could see that mindfulness increases focus and that is being shown in outcomes of students' performance. They can concentrate better, for example. That when we're able to switch our attention from one thing to another, then we become less obsessed with our own issues and that this can lead to a lightness of being and also reduce depression and anxiety. Is it, are you okay? No. When we were looking at the different kinds of mindful practices, there's one called mindful-based stress reduction, which is a particular program which people do, and it includes a regular body scan, a kind of relax, you know how we did that, we scanned through our body and breathed into it. And you could imagine that that could be very de-stressing for people who are um, upset or traumatized sometimes. Um, again, that what they found in the research is that it strengthens attention, reduces self-obsession, gives a lightness of being, also enhances the immune system. So that the, the, uh, the practice is here outlined in that diagram, asking participants to cultivate the capacity to deliberately redirect attention to an arousal neutral mind object. In other words, something like breathing. You ask people to pay attention to that rather than the things that might be bothering them. Then you look at the sensations associated with that and you get, the more you do that, the more you're able to stay with that and keep your focus there. That would create a calmness and it also would help people distinguish between sensations, thoughts and feelings because sometimes all those things get very, very mixed up and the person feels just overwhelmed you know, they're not able to think clearly, they just feel overwhelmed by their emotional state. By being able to say, well, what actually is a sensation? You're taking a step back and you're feeling less, you're feeling more in, in control. So, being mindful then facilitates an inner state of feeling felt, yes. Now this is another dimension that I think is probably very significant, that if we are able to have that awareness of our experience, of our consciousness, of our current state, and we are compassionately present with it, we don't try and push it away or switch it off or numb it, we just are present in a kindly way, that is telling our human system that we are receiving kindness with our way of being, kindness for ourselves. And that facilitates our whole uh, neural networks to, to feel connected with, met, in the same way that a parent would be really attentive to a child. And that can feel more comfortable and it can help all the neural networks integrate. So it can actually help people change little tiny steps. Um, and it helps a sense of coherence and well-being. So that when we did that little exercise of for example, um, befriending a difficulty and of just breathing into the sensations around it. That would be part of that kind of a, a, an exercise. About accepting ourselves, ultimately. So when we switch then to remind ourselves about <coughs> what was found from the compassion-focused approaches and the effect on mood, even a very short experience of loving-kindness practice can change mood. That is the good news. And 
it can boost a good feeling and a sense of social connection. I think that's the mo perhaps almost the most exciting and interesting research from all of this, that something so short could make a big difference. Um, and the suggestion is that there is a reason for that, which is that, in fact, we have a natural caretaking circuitry in our brain, common to all mammals. So it's natural. That's how we're designed as a human race, to, to take care. And it just makes... A, a, this, is, this exercise is inviting us just to wake up to that and remember it. And we mentioned that <coughs> they were surprised to see another benefit, which was that loving kindness also boosts the brain circuits for joy and happiness. And it helps this whole prefrontal cortex, which is often called something like the executive part of our brain, which is trying to decide wisely on the basis of all the information how to act and respond. And it gives us more <coughs> connection between that and all the other areas <coughs> of our system. And the more that happens, the more altruistic the person becomes. Because in a way, you're helping yourself be wiser. You're helping the part of you that can take a, a bigger overview of experience and understanding and make a decision, which must be good news. So the other data which comes more from yoga is that the all of this kind of training on our attention also helps our brain become more finely tuned. We were talking about yesterday how the heart communicates to the brain, but it's as if the that part of the brain gets more used to hearing what that information is and using it. And as I mentioned, it, it, it has compassion-focused approaches have been helpful for post-traumatic stress. When we looked at the role of the heart and the work of a lot of what we were presenting was the findings from HeartMath <coughs> organization. And we remember, we learned from that, from in a different way, um, looking more at the electromagnetic radiations and frequencies, that when, um, when people can achieve long periods of being much more in balance with their heart brain, from the putting, putting their attention in the heart, generating positive feelings, um, that they can generate a long-term coherence. And it becomes more of a habitual experience for people who use that as a daily tool. They're, they're used to coming back to that place. So you can see how that could be very useful as well to people in schools when they're having exams and they learn how to come back to that place of calm in just a few minutes. So remembering what we were doing, we were slowly slowing our breathing down, putting our attention on our heart, pretending we were breathing through our heart and reminding ourselves of some kind of positive, like gratitude, appreciation and love. So it not only is it helpful with coping with anxiety, it's helpful with overall health. And it can retrain us because, of course, whatever, we're, we're creatures of habit and we only have to do things a, little, a few days in a row and it becomes a pattern. And so obviously if you were to do something like this more consistently and regularly, it would become more of a, a pattern that would be easier to do. You wouldn't have to, it would become more automatic. And as well, um, we have been looking at heartfulness and how that works on a very subtle level of putting our attention on our divine centre and our source in our heart. And that also is a place, a way of remembering in a profound way our connection with the source and with the world, which also can be radiated in our daily life. So I'm coming back to thinking about what this idea of resilience is. And this was from, um, there's some, I, I looked for some examples of projects which had been aiming to increase resilience in different populations in India. And some involved um, street children, 
Um, this were, I think this one is uh, it's about um, some young women uh, in Dehradun in the uh, slum. And they give examples of um, a whole program that they carried out and how that made a difference. There's not explicit reference to meditation, but I think we could see, we could imagine how that could be in included. So their definition of resilience was this notion um, of the ability to, to bounce back and to recover from almost anything, which is ambitious, isn't it? And to have a, an attitude of where there's a will, there's a way. They're suggesting that it, in that setting, it's more useful for people to see problems, to reframe is the term. We reframe something we're calling a problem. We're saying, well, perhaps there's an opportunity in this. Perhaps this problem gives me a chance to think differently and learn something or make a better solution. It's also really quite a gritty capacity being resilient because you actually have to sit with things that are not very comfortable are quite hard maybe not very immediately rewarding you've got to have a kind of strength to just not give up and uh, feel hopeless and one of the things they found is that what can help is that just being able to see very tiny things and make the most of them makes a difference to people. Being able to take a little tiny step, often that's less overwhelming than having to try and change the, everything. So if you're feeling very, very despairing, you know, what's one, one small step that will make a difference that I can, can aim for? I mean, I think, it, I think um, this can happen with students where they feel overwhelmed by their amount of work or study they have to do, or the research, or, and, you know, it feels like a mountain that you have to climb. And for, uh, I certainly found it was very helpful for me to say, well, I will just do one tiny bit and I will aim in the next two weeks to do that bit <laughs> and achieve it and not think about the rest, because otherwise I would, it would be too much. Again, they see that having a deep-rooted faith uh, or a system of meaning does really support people. And having a healthy social support network. Now, that is something that often these kinds of interventions can build. There may not be such a, so a strong network, but that's one of the ways that these programs help try to help people, is to uh, enable them to get together with other people in the same situation, to listen and share and feel more connected and more support, which is a lot of self-help groups in all kinds of settings have been very, very successful in giving people strength to overcome problems. The, um, there's one that you're probably familiar with, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. yeah? You know, it's everywhere, isn't it? And that's lasted a very long time and that has some of these aspects to it of having a, a spiritual base and a very specific 12-step program. And, but a lot of it is about creating support and people really befriending each other and really helping each other. And <clears throat> you're also trying to equip people to be able to competently handle. You're trying to give them more tools in which to approach challenges, which might be all kinds of things like useful information, um, contacts, resources. In, in, as, um, I was, again, this is another example from our current state of existence in the UK, which would probably surprise you if you were to see it. But there's a very small, there's a, there's a part of East London which has um, had every sort of problem and challenge you could imagine and people feeling very, very disheartened and unhappy and, and <coughs> the council decided to go in a different route and it took some advice from other places that had similar problems and they decided to approach it in a completely different way and they had some money and they have just started this project but it's already been very successful 
and they opened up just two spaces with some resources, machine tools and sewing machines and other things. And they've just given this space for the local community to use. And this has been extraordinary because it's, it's been a place where people can actually meet each other and talk to each other. And people have started little small businesses and all sorts of projects. And it's changed people's attitudes to where they live. They feel much happier. Uh, they said before I wanted to leave this area, now I'm feeling much more hopeful. So there's, there's a lot to be said for just providing opportunities for people um, to, to find their own solutions and support. Um, I, this, is, this idea of having a wide comfort zone, we, this is the challenge for us all, that we, 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 we have a difficulty embracing newness, otherness, strangeness, difference between us and other people, and also changes in life situation. You know, we're, in a lot, we're in a world where there's increasing millions of people who are in a migration situation, who before, you know, might have been having successful professional lives, and now war has made them lose everything, uh, including their profession. And it's a tremendous amount of challenge to the human being to manage to survive and work through that. So it's, there are many examples of people who do, but we, there are so many things that make us feel safe and secure <laughs> that, uh, people c that people lose in, in very extreme situations. Uh, and then this links with the next point about how to help us panic, uh, how to help us cope from these things. So I think we, the context of this whole course really is in the, in the reality that we are living in a very um, dramatically changing world with uncertainties. So we need to think of resilience on lots of levels, that it's both a personal capacity but it's also about how we provide resources, how the community and social system works, the cultural patterns. If you live in a, in a culture which promotes which a, a sense of community, a sense of value for each person, a sense of inclusion, a sense of um, encouragement, then that's a very different context than if you're living in a community where everyone feels you're on your own, you're out for yourself. <laughs> you know. And, and we're not, you know, it's almost like a community which has a heart base to it and one that doesn't are very different. But then, of course, there's always a mix. There's a mix of in all, in all cult communities. And the other thing that does make a difference is, is to have at least, to have one person who could be of support to you. You may not have a big family at all. You may have a one parent, but that's enough to make some difference to people. And sometimes uh, programmers try and help um, young people by finding mental figures for them. If they, uh, that, that is tremendously helpful to support them if they're, if they're missing. And then we have to remember we're not, we can be resilient in one place, not another. And you might have your own thoughts about what makes a difference. Um, is resilience something intrinsic? Is it to do with our environment? Or can we learn it? So these are just things to think about. And uh, this, is, um, this is from a department um, of further education in UK. There, there they've identified factors that make a difference in the child, in the family, in the school, in the community and things that can make a difference. Being a girl is one of the things that seems to help. Uh, being outgoing, having good communication skills, being able to plan, having a sense of humour, being able to problem solve, having capacity to reflect. Now some of those things we can't do things about, but other things we can. Some of the things we can help people reflect, we can help people feel good about themselves. 
We can help people learn how to solve problems and think. Um, and we can give affection and, and support. And they've got other things that happen in the school, bullying, discrimination, breakdown of friendship, peer pressure, poor pupil to teacher relationships. And the, I think in, in, the, in the current way things are being, teachers are, are trying to work, they may not be able to, but they're trying to really support young people, pick up when they have problems, have counselling available for them, try and find solutions that will be supportive. And really they give a lot of love, a lot of love. We've had um, in the UK several programmes about how schools really work, you know, like a fly on the wall, what goes on through the term. And I have just been so um, touched by the level of love and commitment that the teachers offer the students. And, and uh, it's really inspiring. It doesn't always solve everything, but it makes so much of a difference if there's that real in acceptance of, of children's difficulties, which can be understood when we understand the backgrounds they might be enduring. So I just see this was a project Uh, yeah, the first example, as I've sort of mentioned, is that increasingly nowadays, and some of you have mentioned in your own school, um, that there is a recognition of the real value of doing re relaxation and meditation with children. And that's showing up time and time again that that can really help. And they enjoy it. And they find it, it supports them. Then we've got some other examples. Uh, where is it? Yes, this was a program for young women in Dehradun between the ages of 12 and 24. And I think I've given you the reference for it. So they conducted a program which had elements of all these things in it. So it was a lot, a lot of sort of group work and facilitation of learning and they felt that it would be helpful for the young women to have a stronger sense of self-worth. So some of the activities they carried out were to help them have a better sense of self-worth, that it would help them to be clearer about what their emotions were and how to manage them um, and how to cope with tension. So they're trying to help people have better relations with themselves and others. Helping with communication skills. Sharing of passive and aggressive styles. Um, they're trying to help people more, be more clear and not just react. Helping them to listen and helping to stop bullying. How to come back from difficulties by problem solving and, and trying to make relationships that lasted, how to be more self-protecting self uh, in terms of things like drugs, um, sexual abuse, community support and planning skills. And they would involve the whole group in thinking about how to plan for projects that would support them. So there was a, it was a multifaceted program with these young women to support them to be able to manage their lives in a way that would be a lot more enhancing of their well-being and help them to cope. So that was impressive. And they've also done, there's also been one with, um, which I haven't got the evidence for, but it was about working with street children, which must, who must be a very number one example of resilience. But they were also doing a project with them and giving them a chance to think about giving them a little bit of sort of power and thinking about well, how would they like to um, organise possibilities that could be offered them.
It gave them some more decision-making empowerment. Good morning. And here's, this is from this Boeing. <laughs> I just wanted to show you the, the sort of scope of it. Of this is, this is some thinking about programs for teachers to be uh, conscious of um, or to implement in schools. They do all kinds of training and they offer people very specific activities for the classroom. But they're, they're thinking in these kinds of things that there are, there's an area about how do we keep safe and well. You've got in that blue column. How did they get to school? Um, for example, in um, I'm sorry to talk about my my own personal experience, and you would probably have others, but it's different from when I was at school. But when I go to meet my grandson from his primary school, the teacher always makes sure that whoever is picking the child up, you know, is known to her and make sure that they're safe in that way, coming and going. Um, sounds quite obvious, but they didn't used to do that when I was at school. <laughs> we just used to walk to school. Uh, and th th diet and eating healthily is a big issue, you know, to, so that people they know what to, what will be, what will keep them well. Um, being able to have sufficient exercise and air, sleep and all those things being free from prejudice and discrimination, that having the school hold very strong values but that, that will not be tolerated any kind of um, prejudice or attacks on children because of difference. So the school has to hold quite these things quite strongly to help children feel safe and feel entitled to feel safe and feel um, and learn core values. And then they're trying to help them be better at keeping relationships going because relationships are so core to resilience, aren't they? That being able to share with people, ask people's advice, feel you can rely on people and all that. If you're someone who's, who's not learned how to really do that or listen or then you're, you're making life a lot harder for yourself. And it's something that can be taught. Uh, you know, that even when uh, at kindergarten, <laughs> nursery level, I discovered they were being taught about taking turns to listen and speak. <laughs> so I was told that I didn't, I didn't take my turn properly. So, yeah. Um, and also for the person, the child to think about who can they count on? Who's a person in their life they can count on? I don't know how any of this sounds to you. Does it sound it's obvious or immediate, you know? M maybe it all happens by itself. But um, these are ways that people are trying to support children anyway. So they're helping, uh, if we look at the column about solving problems, you can see one that says calming down and self-soothing. One of the things that they've learned from looking at the attachment process between mother and child is that there's this possibility or this process that we have as carers of infants and children to tune in, to synchronize, to be coherently connected so that we're really picking up accurately what they're feeling and the baby feels known by us. And this is how we learn to regulate our feelings because the, the, the carer, when the child's upset, picks them up and pats them, strokes them, or makes a soothing sound, and the baby becomes calmed down. And ideally, that whole process then becomes part of the learning within our system so that we can learn to do that ourselves as adults. We can self-soothe. And one of the big distinctions that they feel is 
um, a problem for people is that it's, if you're lucky enough to have had that and you can do that for yourself, then that makes a huge difference. Whereas quite a lot of people in our world can't. They get in a state, but they can't bring themselves down for it, from it. So this is again something that could be helped by meditation practices to, to be able to have a bit more control over your feelings. Because some children, young people, they don't want to get into an aggressive state. They just get triggered and they lash out and then they get into trouble and then it becomes a vicious circle that they can't get out of. So any intervention that helps a child build better relationships, calm themselves down, will mean their whole life will change. People will respond to them differently. They'll be able to be less taken over by things. I was looking to see if I could show you anything about resilience and there's a lot of TED Talks about resilience and people's experiences and one man who works with very difficult children and um, he said that one, this boy said well his aim would be not to have a bad day when nothing but his whole day was full of just difficulties and I have another colleague in UK who works with very very difficult children um, who have a really severe problems and she has managed to do some relaxation with them and it has made a huge difference. They really appreciate it. So, so these are, these are the kinds of things you can find. I, this is something that was offered from the, um, na the health service or in Scotland. In their t they, they came up with this resilience toolkit. Uh, remain positive, establish realistic goals, have strategies, have a sense of your strength, be confident, identity, learn. So they've gone through the all resilience. And this was being promoted, just as an example. Um, and I'm just going to come to the end in a moment. Now... This work on resilience is very much linking into the whole field of positive psychology and uh, which is really trying to show us what we need to do to keep our sense of well-being. And these are just some findings that they, overall findings. Number one, people overestimate the impact of money on their happiness quite a lot. It does have some influence but not as much as we might think. So that's some research. Secondly, spending money on experiences provides a bigger boost than spending money on material possessions. Uh, gratitude is a big contributor to happiness. The more we cultivate gratitude, the happier we will be. So we have that suggestion of thinking of five or ten things every day. And oxytocin, this magic hormone, which is related to, to bonding and connection and, or you know, stroking pets, may provoke greater trust, empathy and morality in humans, meaning that giving hugs or other shows of physical affection may give you a big boost to your overall well-being and the well-being of others. So anytime we reinforce that, uh, that kind of love. Those who intentionally cultivate a positive mood to match the outward emotion they need to display um, benefit by more genuinely experiencing it. In other words, um, putting on a happy face won't necessarily make you feel happier, but putting a bit of effort likely will. <laughs> even, you know, even just sort of aiming to feel a bit of loving kindness. And it's, it's people with happy friends and significant others are more likely to be happy. Um, people who perform acts of kindness offer don't uh, get not only get a boost in well-being they are also more accepted by their peers volunteering time to a cause you believe in improves your well-being and life satisfaction may even reduce symptoms of depression uh, i mean I, I feel happier just reading this list <laughs> <laughs> spending money on other people results in greater happiness for the giver so i think i think it's a very positive list that so nearly finished. Um, 
I think this all comes back to in many ways that the more we're connected we feel with the with nature, with ourselves, with each other, the happier we'll be in a way, I think. Uh, and with the universe. And this is this is really where meditation is really supporting us to to feel a deeper joy of existence. So I thought I thought that was a beautiful image. Um, that's what I, I think in heartfulness. I have found these things that it connects us to our deepest source in our heart, like the taproot in the tree. It connects us to ourself and others in the environment. It lightens the burden of stuck tendencies and reactions. It provides an inner ground of stability when outside things are uncertain. It provides a purpose and a direction. It facilitates simplicity and harmony. It brings joy and inner peace. And it reveals the profound subtlety of love. So those things I can't say are facts, things I have found that I would like to share. And I think that image of a tree is like captures that essence really. So um, thank you for all that. Um, so I thought that Mm-hmm. 